Thanks to Ren for sponsoring this video. Have you ever been relaxing, just enjoying an episode of Kitchen Nightmares? Wake up! You wake up, idiot! When you think to yourself, hmm, I wonder if this place is still open. I might want to go try it out one day if I'm ever in this obscure town in Massachusetts that I've never been to before. Only to find out that it closed a decade ago with leftover Yelp reviews that only mentioned their episode on Kitchen Nightmares, regardless if positive or negative. And I don't know if that's just a me thing, but I'm willing to bet that most of you out there have done the same thing. Kitchen Nightmares followed seven Michelin star Scottish, hunky, talented, tall, handsome, <clears throat> Chef Gordon Ramsay through his endeavors to visit failing restaurants across the United States to, at the end of the episode, improve the terrible food, atmosphere, and management, and set the failing business up for a success. And because the restaurant was now tied to Gordon Ramsay's name, there's always a boost in customers shortly after the Ramsay renovation. That's the, the new show on HGTV, Ramsay Renovation. He had a separate Kitchen Nightmares show in the UK first, but we'll get to that later. Kitchen Nightmares US aired for almost exactly seven years, from September 2007 to September 2014, so basically my entire awkward phase. They visited 77 restaurants across 92 episodes, including revisits, and as of today, mid-2022, guess how many of those 77 episodes are still open? Maybe like 25 or maybe half of them, no, 15 are still open to this day. Most of the places closed within a few years of the episode airing, with many, many of them closing before their episode even aired, and I wanted to know why. I cross-checked this data myself, just in case it was outdated from what I was researching. Um, so this information is updated as of today. There are 15 restaurants still open that were featured on the show. So these restaurants were made to seem that for sure, 100% of the restaurants that were on Kitchen Nightmares were on trajectory to close down for good without Gordon Ramsay's help. What's the debt? About 850. 850,000. Yeah. And you've only been open for 18 months. Right. What in the f have you been doing? So, with 15 of those still open, are they only surviving because of Gordon Ramsay's help? Are the other restaurant's failures really Gordon's fault or inability to help properly? Or does the management just revert to their old ways after Gordon leaves, resulting in their own downfall? I mean, it's hard to believe that true change of heart and often very stubborn management causing the downfall can be improved for longevity in just the few days that Gordon is there helping them. That's like speed running human emotions. So for us to investigate, first we must understand the Kitchen Nightmares formula. Oh yeah, there's a formula. It is a reality show overall. And if you've binged any amount of Kitchen Nightmare episodes, you might notice that they all nearly happen the exact same way every single time. Gordon Ramsay visits a failing restaurant somewhere in the US. He meets the owners, he sits down, has lunch, it's always lunch, spitting out the food, sending it back, roasting the interior design and filth of the place as he waits for the next food item. Then he yells at the owners and staff about how gross the food is. In the evening, Gordon observes their dinner service, which is awful every episode, then inspects the kitchen and ingredients during dinner service, sometimes stopping service if what he finds is too dangerous, like any living creature that isn't human or raw meat near other food. Basically anything a customer could die from. Not sure why he decides to inspect the restaurant during the dinner service and not before the chaotic dinner service with a hundred people in the dining room when the staff probably hasn't seen more than one family at a time in like 10 years. Anyway, then he yells at the staff after dinner service about the service and his findings in the kitchen, sometimes followed by a more calm conversation with the owners and Gordon. Bill's too big. Relax, 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 relax. About their financial problem or the more in-depth reason that the restaurant is failing. Overnight, Gordon's team completely redoes the restaurant's interior and signage. The next day, the owners are revealed to their new restaurant and new menu that Gordon worked on, often completely throwing away the old menu. By this point, the owners or problem characters in the episode has suddenly had a change of heart and is now accepting of Gordon's help after being the most insufferable, arrogant narcissist literally the day before. He has no idea what he's talking about, so whatever he has to tell me, I don't really care. To try to get everything I can to have somebody like that show you. Awesome. And then for him to come in, you know, tell me that I needed to get back into it. And he actually did. He, you know, made me feel like uh, I wanted to cook again. 
Now Gordon lets the staff taste and learn the new menu. Then they prepare for the second dinner service with issues and menu improved. There's a problem in the middle of dinner service every time, but they typically finish out the night strong. Gordon does a little frantic pee pee dance and everyone's happy and Gordon leaves. Then sometimes we'll get the camera crew revisiting the restaurant a few months later just to check in and everything is usually seemingly good most of the time and the episode ends. And that's how most of the episodes go. There are two standouts from this formula that come to mind. I'm, I know that there's more, but these two don't quite follow the formula exactly. But first, you might be wondering how much of this show is staged? How much of it is complete baloney? Faked? Ratatouille? <laughs> Can that be a new synonym? I mean, over the 90 whatever episodes they have, all follow this exact formula. And most of the problem characters on the show have a sudden change of heart overnight. I don't buy it. So how much of it is staged? Well, I did some digging. I did a lot of digging. I went into so many articles and even some Quora forums? Quora? Quara? Quara? Quora forums from former production crew? Who the fuck uses Quora anymore? Whoever used Quara? I'll spare you the reading and give you the cliff notes. You're welcome. Basically, the show is mostly real, with some swaying by the producers. Mostly everything that you see on the show actually happens. I speak feline. With some exceptions where the producers actually faked aspects of the episode, but far less than what you might think. In the episode when they visited Finn McCool's in the Hamptons, first of all, your last name is McCool? That's alpha behavior. You were born with that. Finn of House McCool at your service. It sounds like a fake name that you use to sign up for a website you don't really care about. Finn McCool is the true alpha male. Anyway, in this episode, there's a kitchen staff that drops a chicken wing on the the floor and then picks it up to put it back in the fryer. Yeah, he was a plant. He was a plant. They hired this dude just for the filming of this episode. He didn't actually work there. In that same episode, there's a scene where the chef walks out on their family and drives away, which was completely fabricated by the editors. The van waiting outside wasn't even his. It was the plumbers. You know, plumbers have saved more, more lives, lives than, than doctors. doctors. Show some respect. And you know how the first dinner service is always chaotic and the staff is always overwhelmed and messes up? I'm sorry? Take their food away. Why? because we're not serving anymore. Well, the producers actually overbook those dining rooms for those dinner services on purpose to create chaos and stress for the staff. On that specific episode of Finn McCool's, the owner said that they overbooked the restaurant by about a hundred guests. And this was all information from an interview with the restaurant owner who was on the show. He's really just a chill Irish guy. He wasn't the problem person on the episode, so I don't think he's making these things up about what was fabricated on his episode. Though there's no telling how much more of that type of fakery occurred on the show, when looking at testimonials from the owners and production crew, it didn't seem to happen very often at all. All the human emotions that we see on screen are completely real. <laughs> But the catch is that the producers purposefully push these people to that point on purpose. Perry the platypus pooping on my producers push the people to the point of emotion on purpose. So it's like putting me in a crowded room and then filming me freak out. And this happens on every reality show. It's not unique to kitchen nightmares. Like the cast of The Ultimatum is put under so much pressure and put into these conflicting situations on purpose, bringing out the worst in them, showing their ugly side to the camera. There's also this thing called leading questions during those talking head interviews. Producers ask purposefully provoking or leading questions to pull a certain more dramatized response from the person. This happens on the news, reality shows, video and written journalism. It's all on purpose. In fact, I turned in a mini documentary in my film class in college where I interviewed someone and my professor specifically told me to, in the future, try to ask more provoking questions on purpose that might be uncomfortable because it leads to a better and more captivating story. And he's absolutely right, though I wish he taught us how to interview before the assignment, but whatever. TLDR, most of it is absolutely real. For example, the mouse they caught on camera during the Blackberries episode, we'll get to that episode later, was 100% real. And Gordon just picks it up by the tail with his bare hands. Why, Gordon? Former production team member Adam said that the show is entertainment and while nobody is faking emotion, the way 
way the show is made puts their hearts on their sleeves. I'm stopping the video real quick to tell you that I'm on a trading card now. I collabed with Rap Trading to create this really cool card. It's on sale now at raptrading.co. They really killed it with this design, so I'm, I'm really proud of it. Now you can say, hey, you've activated my cringe card, and then it's me. I'm the cringe collector. So make sure you get that, raptrading.co. Really cool collab, and I'm super proud of it. So thanks, back to the video. So I mentioned earlier how there are two standout episodes from the formula, and these episodes on opposite extreme ends of the spectrum will help us find out if Gordon is partially at fault for 62 of the 77 restaurants he tried to help completely failing. They're also just fun to watch, but I digress. And I say partially at fault here because there's no way Gordon could be fully responsible for a restaurant's failure because these restaurants were all doomed to fail before they were even on the show. And You're losing half a million dollars a year. What's the debt? About 850. But he is in debt somewhere in the hundreds of thousands. My father's invested everything he has into this business. His whole life as a cop and, and retirement and pension and this and that, it's gone. If we don't get this restaurant going, we're gonna have to sell our home. That's why they got on the show, actually. But uh, that's probably obvious. Anyway, the first one is Amy's Baking Company in Scottsdale, Arizona. Dude. These people were so insane that this is the first and only restaurant that Gordon Ramsay has ever walked out on on the show. Good luck. They would yell and insult customers. You up from here. You understand? Sammy? You, you off. You yourself. Go out, you it was crazy. And Amy wasn't even that bad of a chef and was actually a good baker. Thank you. Uh, that's beautiful. Mm. Oh. The issues with the restaurant were obviously the owners. They would yell at the staff. 4B. No, no, 5B. Are you sure? You don't need to question me, Katie. You can go okay. home right now. Send Katie home right no. now. No, I don't no, need no, an attitude cool. from her. She comes no, no, in, she's okay. in. It's because there's the two others. What a little Start fights with customers and not give tips to the servers. They would just keep the tips. Good tips? I don't make tips. Say that again. I make hourly. Serious? So where did the tips go? The owner. Even the producers jumped in to stop the conflict at one point. Even the producers thought, no, this this is too much. And that episode was 100% real. After this episode aired, Amy's Baking Company went viral and patrons would travel to go visit the restaurant for themselves to see if it was really as it appeared on TV. And it was. Every blogger or normal person, you have to be one or the other, you can't, you have to make the distinction. You're either a blogger or a normal person. That went Went there said yes the owners are actually fucking insane and while Amy's baking company did go on to close in 2015 the owners Amy and Sammy are now moved to Israel and Amy is still baking posting her pastries on Instagram what this episode demonstrates to the extreme is that some people just can't be helped. Some people don't want to be helped. You might be wondering why they even invited Gordon Ramsay in the first place to come help them. Well, it was because they blamed the restaurant's problems on the haters and the bloggers. There's a lot of online bullies and haters and bloggers. And they needed Gordon's help to combat the evil bloggers. Evil, evil bloggers. Star new bloggers. And that's what happens. Most of the issues in the failing restaurants are almost the exact same. Before I get into that, though, the second standout episode of Kitchen Nightmares is Blackberries, where I mentioned the mouse earlier. He goes to the bathroom after praying and eating rotten intestines as the owner laughs maniacally. <laughs> <laughs> But then the dessert slaps, birthing this iconic clip. That is delicious. Finally, some good fucking food. Which wasn't even made by the chefs, it was made by the owner's mother, aptly named Mama Mary. Amen. Aww. This episode features a family-owned soul food restaurant in Plainsfield, New Jersey, where the owner is a bit stubborn and a little bit of a control freak over the staff. This never changes, though, throughout the whole episode, even though usually they're able to somehow turn the owners into a new person by the end of the episode to accept the new changes. I don't know what the chef is talking about. About. and a lot of people love it. I do, I eat it. I've been doing this for 37 years. Chef Ramsey was a kid when I first started cooking. I should know a little bit more than he does. Chef Ramsey is a remarkable, remarkable man. I am grateful and thankful to him for coming here and opening my eyes.
Mother Mary delivers godlike advice. You just can't close ears to someone that's come to help you. And Blackberries sadly closed in March of 2013, just a year and five months after their episode aired. And according to a production team member who worked on that episode, they say, Blackberries was failing because it had a crack house for a neighbor. There weren't enough customers in the neighborhood for a sit down meal. Everybody who went there loved it. She was in high demand as a caterer, taking her food to fancy parties and non crack houses. So while the food could have been improved, and it was afterwards, it wasn't the reason why the restaurant was failing or it wasn't the only reason the restaurant was failing. So I think it was obvious, even before I talked about these specific episodes, that of course it's not always Gordon's sole fault that these restaurants fail. The similarities of these two episodes both boil down to stubborn owners who don't want to change their menu, appearance, or try anything new. That was dry, dry pate, dry. It's good like that. We have people tell us all the time that it's good. good. And this is true for most of the 77 restaurants that Gordon tried to help. The antagonist of each episode is sometimes comically absurd, but they all share the same qualities. They're stubborn, they don't listen to suggestions or take advice from staff, they treat staff poorly, they think highly of themselves and displays arrogant behavior, they think highly of their food, and they don't take criticism well. And are these coincidences that they all share these qualities? Or are these just qualities of bad business owners who are the exact type of people to end up on Kitchen Nightmares? Well, let's look at the few businesses that are still open to this day to see if there's anything that stands out. I compiled every restaurant still in business to see if ownership changed or was sold, if Gordon's improvements were kept, and their review rating on Google. And upon reviewing these episodes, I didn't notice anything out of the blue or extraordinary about these restaurants that I thought set them apart from the ones that failed. 11 out of the 15 had what I would consider stubborn and arrogant owners who seemingly changed by the end of the episode, just like all the ones that failed. The other four received the change as well and were mostly owners who are just simply clueless and had a lack of direction and knowledge on how to run a successful restaurant or didn't have good leadership skills. But that is also true for most of the restaurants that failed too. Two. And only two of the 15 ended up forfeiting ownership to someone else entirely. And one restaurant is still owned by the same people, but under new management, which greatly improved the place according to reviews. And this is something fun that I found while researching. One of the restaurants that is still open, Oceana, you can't find their episode anywhere. Why? Oh, because they sued Gordon Ramsay twice, trying to prevent the airing of the episode back in 2011. And they sued again in 20. 2018 for posting a clip of their episode on social media that made them look bad. Luckily though, you can still find the cliff notes for the episode. I'll put it in the description below. So what the heck was it that made these businesses succeed over the rest? According to Business Insider, according to the National Restaurant Association, according to me, in general, all restaurants, about 30% of restaurants fail in their first year and another 30% fail sometime in the following two years. But then I found a Forbes article saying that only 17% of restaurants close in their first year. So at a rate of 62 out of 77 restaurants that Gordon visited, Google tells me that's an 80% failure rate as opposed to the 17 or 30% failure rate. And this boggled my mind, but then I forgot to consider that that data is only the first year or the first two years. What about the next 10 years? What about the next 15 years since Gordon visited their restaurant? Well, I looked into it and of course, According to this article that is according to Cornell University in Michigan State, 70% of restaurants that had opened for business a decade before had failed. So now that 80% failure rate from Gordon's show makes a little more sense when you consider the 8 to 15 year gap since Gordon visited their restaurant. So Gordon's 80% failure rate really isn't that far off the norm in general. A lot of the time, the causes for failed restaurants on the show boiled down to overwhelming financial financial debt that just couldn't be helped. It was too late to save them, even if they started doing better after Gordon leaves. There was no significant improvement. How long could you afford to stay open for? We're in, we're in trouble right now. You know, we're 
probably, I would say, $5,000 a week or $4,000 a week under what we need to survive. A lack of change in management, lack of consistency in the quality of management, staff, food, etc. Sometimes it could even be the location of the restaurant that isn't good. And what a lot of people don't consider is that many of these episodes were filmed around the 2008 Great Recession, where many restaurants were failing anyway. So that alone made it harder for restaurants to get back up on their feet, even if they tried their best after Gordon left. And sometimes it'll just take a lot longer than the couple days that Gordon is there in order to turn the restaurant around for good. Sometimes he'll bring in a temporary chef or accountant. A lot of times people are good at what they do, but running the business itself, you have to bring in some help. To help them out for a month or two, but there's only so much you can do to help without completely holding their hand forever. Actually, according to Gordon himself, once he left the restaurants, operators at the restaurants he tried to help frequently went back to the practices that caused their troubles in the first place. And before you say it, I looked into it. None of the restaurants closed during the great P word of 2020. They all closed years before 2020. The closest one is the 16th surviving restaurant restaurant, Cafe Han in Baltimore, actually closed its doors this year. That was the most recent one, but that was the only one I could find during or after 2020. But honestly, not all parts of running a successful business can even be learned or taught. It is a talent. Like, sure, Ed Sheeran can learn to sing better. I'm addicted oh. to but you can't always turn a bad singer into Ariana Grande. You have to have some level of innate talent from the start to be able to just get it and learn from there. You know what I mean? And that's just my opinion, but there's gotta be some validity to it. We've all met people who should never run a business or definitely do not have the potential or what it takes. Like this one dude who opened a restaurant, it failed, so he opened another and guess what he changed? Nothing. He used the same menu from the last one one, the same cups, the same everything, and was borrowing money from his stepdaughter to keep the business afloat, absolutely ruining her credit, and still couldn't figure out what he had to change in order to succeed. Obviously, that restaurant closed as well. This guy's a doofus, and with financial ruin aside, that's okay. We're all doofuses at some things. Sometimes, knowing when to quit can be just as honorable as the keep pushing, you can do it mentality. Pursue what you're good at. If you're curious about why the other restaurants have closed, luckily someone did the work in compiling every restaurant's reason for closure, so I didn't have to do as much work on this portion. It is mostly updated, with some exceptions, so just keep that in mind. I had to fact check and update the lists myself for this video. And if you're wondering how these stats compare to the Kitchen Nightmares UK version, Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmares, that one aired from 2004 to 2014, three years longer than the American version. There are six seasons and somehow only 31 episodes. Clearly the focus was being put on the American run of the show, which makes sense considering how wildly successful it was. In the UK, Gordon visited 24 restaurants and only three of them are open to this day. Google tells me this is a passing rate of 12.5% and I don't know why most of these restaurants failed in the UK. I'm too tired to look into it, but this is a good time for me to bring up how hilariously different the two versions of the show are. There are no words to explain it, so I'm just gonna show you a clip from each one. Because 98% of what you've done so far has been wrong. But right now you're both wrapped up in a bubble as if it's working, but they're not coming in. Bullshit, Justin. Richie, it's fucked. Do I really not know what I'm doing at all? So frustrating. But that was not a thin crust. I am disagreeing with you. I have. We are not in pizza. 1985, Pete. Do you think that your father is serving the best pizza in Denver? Not anymore. I don't think there's anything wrong with the American version. It keeps my little brain's attention. It makes everything so dramatic and captivating. That fucking violin noise gets me every time. So both UK and US versions of the show gracefully ended in 2014, with Gordon tired of the owners reverting back to their old ways after he leaves. Then they close and get it blamed on Gordon. So he said, I woke up one morning and I said, fuck it, I'm done. I don't care about the environment. I think I'm doing fine. I ride my bike where I can, I turn off the TV when I'm not using it. What more could you ask for? You're delusional! 
There are so many other ways to help the environment. And how do I do that, huh? Well, you can start by using the sponsor of today's video, Ren. If you want to offset your carbon footprint but aren't sure where to start, Ren makes it easy for anyone to make a difference. Ren calculates your carbon footprint via a short quiz, which then you can offset by funding different projects, making a true difference around the world. It's a monthly subscription, and they send you frequent updates about how your projects are doing with photos and everything. I appreciate the efforts that Ren is making, especially in the climate of today where everything is awful all the time. My favorite project of theirs is protecting the Amazon rainforest by working with the indigenous people that live there to help prevent deforestation. So the first 100 people to sign up using my link gets their first month at Ren for free. The link is on the screen and in the description below. Thank you so much for using the links in my videos. It helps me pay for life, support the channel, and keeps me doing YouTube full time. And this really is my dream job, so thank you. Get Ren for a month free using my link and back to the video. Thank you to my patrons who support this channel. If you made it to the end, consider subscribing to this channel and my second channel, where things are a little more unscripted. I put so much more research into this video than almost any other video on my channel, so I really hope you enjoyed it. Bye. Let me take my patrons, cause we're going to Gordon Ramsay. He'll help us for free. We'll get good ratings on TV. Gordon Ramsay forever, this restaurant's endeavor, Gordon Ramsay forever.